Blessed are those who thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hello and welcome to our Thirsty Podcast here on the Raised with Jesus Podcast Network. And uh, my name is Jeremy Lightman. I'm here with my co-host, Michael Zarling. We, our guests today are some members of our Church Water of Life here in Racine, Tim and Robin Went. I'm very excited to have them and talk to them about their lives. So welcome, Went family. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the things that I know about the two of you is that, you know, Tim, you've been in the Coast Guard for how many years? So I did 27 years active duty, and I uh, retired in 2018, and now I'm working for the Coast Guard as a civilian employee, and I'm coming up on five years doing that. So can you tell our listeners, and probably especially Jeremy and myself, I think, do you know anything about the Coast Guard? Uh, Actually, my dad's dad, my paternal grandpa, was in the Coast Guard in World War II, and uh, I never knew this until like right before he died, he was telling some stories about um, how he would uh, travel with the convoys and he had, they had to uh, circle the convoys or uh, the, na- the Navy overseas. And, and so he would, he went to, I never thought he saw active duty, but he said he went to Af- North Africa and the Mediterranean and all that. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that uh, in time of war, the Coast Guard falls under the Department of Navy. So we actually become a a part of the Department of Navy. So our ships, a lot of cases, get painted gray. Normally, they're painted white or black or uh, red if you're on an icebreaker. Um, So, yeah, the Coast Guard has been in every armed conflict the nation's ever served. We currently have ships over in the Persian Gulf today. Um, I've never been, been stationed overseas. We've always been stateside. But, yeah, it's a little-known fact. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the Coast Guard does uh, fight in every war. So how is the Coast Guard connected with the Navy? Because I was thinking, too, not only do I not know anything about the Coast Guard, I don't know anything about the Navy except for, like, McHale's Navy and Mr. Roberts' movie. Well, Mr. Roberts is one of my favorite movies. Okay. Um, so it, the Coast Guard is a seagoing service, just like the, the Navy and the Marine Corps are. Uh, the Coast Guard, though does not fall under the Department of Defense. We uh, started under the as, as customs officers, so we were Department of Treasury until 1967, and then we transferred to the Department of Transportation, where we stayed until 2001, uh, when the or 2003, when the Department of Homeland Security was stood up, and then we've been in DHS now for 20 years. So what is your position in the Coast Guard? Because... Rob and I were talking about this a little bit of how your rank and the ranks of the Coast Guard and the Navy are different from the other military branches. Yeah, so the Coast Guard and Navy uh, kind of follow the traditional nautical ranks. So an officer would be, you start as an ensign and you would uh, progress up. Um, so you've got a lieutenant, um, lieutenant commander, commander, uh, captain, which is what I was when I retired. And then you have a couple of uh, variations of admirals, rear admiral, lower half, rear admiral, um, upper half, um, vice admiral, and then admiral. So one, two, three, and a four-star admiral. I didn't make it that far, which I'm very happy I didn't, uh, because I wouldn't be here today if I was. So what Rob and I were talking about, so Robin, why don't you let our listeners know of you know our conversation on Wednesday morning, like how... Tim's rank as a captain is similar to other ranks in other military branches. Well, there's a lot of times there's a lot of there's misunderstanding um, because a captain in the Coast Guard or the Navy is an 06. So they have 25 years roughly in the service. Um, in the Army, and I believe the Marines, they have, um, their lieutenants are like O-1s, like straight straight out of their commissioning service. And um, so when you have agencies working together, um, there can be some confusion, especially amongst the spouses. Um, I have, there's a funny story. We had friends, um, he was Army. And we were Coast Guard, and um, he was working in an interagency office, and he got a phone call on the weekend, and his wife said, oh, it's some captain so-and-so. And he jumped up 
and he grabbed the phone and he covered it up and he said, this is back, you know, when you still had a wall phone. Um, he covered it up. He said, that's a Navy captain. And he was very like, I can't believe you just did that. Cause he just, she gave the, she kind of gave the captain a little bit of attitude. Like, why are you calling us on the weekend and things like that? Um, and this Navy captain was clearly higher rank than he was at the time. Because a captain in the because army. Ca- right. So this was in 06 and he was probably in 04, 05 at the time. Yeah, and, the, and a captain in the Army would be an 03. Right. Equivalent to a lieutenant or in the Coast Guard or Navy. Yeah. yeah. What are all those numbers? So O would signify an officer, um, and you have enlisted ranks as well. So it, it comes down to um, essentially your um, seniority in an organization. So enlisted, if you, if you don't go through a commissioning source um, and become a commissioned officer, you could enlist in the service. Um, and it, it comes down to there's a pay disparity and enlisted um, start as E1s and they can go up through E9s. Um, officer go O1 up to O10. Hmm. So 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 it's it's like a progression up the up the ranks and the pay scales. Hmm. So Robin, I, and I remember a couple of years ago that you and Tim, you said you were taking like your first big vacation, you took a cruise to Rome and so forth. And I think you said something like that was the first time in 25 years of marriage you'd be with each other for like 25 days straight. Yes. Um, the years that Tim was on a ship um, and the one in particular I'm thinking of, they were gone 180 days a year. Um, and on some ships, they have the similar days away, but they're in two and three month um, clumps of time. But the ship he was on was not. They would go out for 10 days and they'd be in for three and then be out for two and they'd be in for 15. And then they'd be. So it was never a set schedule. So we had probably four times the amount of actual hellos and goodbyes that some of these larger ships did. And they were gone for the same amount of time. Um, and I joked with him when we were in, um, Oregon that did you, I heard on the radio today, did you know that in the state of California, if you're gone more than 180 days a year, you're considered an absentee parent. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it didn't really buy me a whole lot of sympathy, but <laughs> I had to point it out. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it can be, it, I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> I was going to ask Tim um, two things. One of them was, uh, what is the, I've heard these terms before, but I know nothing about any of it. Uh, The low admiral, lower half, admiral, upper half, like what is it? Halves of what? So essentially when you become an admiral, um, it's just, it's just a rank. So rear admiral, lower half, rear admiral, upper half is uh, rear admiral, lower half is it's a, it's a new flag officer, new admiral. Um, and usually it's about two years. If they don't do anything to mess anything up, they get promoted to rear admiral upper half. Um, I don't know what, what the, I, I haven't done the research to know why there's a distinction between upper, upper and lower half. It's just, that's the, it's just a, a gradation of some kind. Correct. And, and do you, you don't have to, if, if you don't want to, but could you expand upon why you would not be alive today if you would have. Uh, made a, a higher ranking. Uh, what I'm saying is, I wouldn't be here at Water of Life. I'd still be on active duty, and we'd be someplace else. Oh, you'd be. So I'd still, I'll still, I'd still be roaming the earth. Uh, okay, but someplace else. Okay. So, so with that, being in the Coast Guard this many years, like how many times have you moved? And you know, talk about that and your the different churches that you've been a part of for all those different years. We're sitting here pointing at each other. You take this one. No, you take this one. Um, so we have moved, I think we, we've counted 12 times. Um, so we've been married now coming up on 32 years this June, um, and we've moved 12 times. Um, in that tw- in those 12 moves, we've had 13 churches, one of those being the church that we grew up in because we were fortunate to move back to Sturgeon Bay for two years. Um, and that was back 1998 to 2000. We were up in Sturgeon Bay. So, um, yeah, we've been fortunate every place the Coast Guard has sent us. There has been a Wisconsin Synod Church there with probably one exception. When we moved to Oregon, there was a church. And when I called the vacancy pastor, he said, oh, 
um, your four will double the size of our worship service on Sunday <laughs> night every other week. But we don't have any Bible study. We don't have any uh, Sunday school. So we talked to our pastors up in Sturgeon Bay, and they said, well, try the Missouri Synod Church. And when you walk in, you'll know pretty quickly what type of Missouri Synod Church it is, whether it's a little bit more liberal or a little bit more conservative. Um, I felt like I took a step back about 15 years and very conservative Missouri Synod Church. So we ended up um, leaving the Wisconsin Synod for two years, joined the Missouri Synod. Um, the kids had a Christian school that was at the uh, Christian school at the church. And we got involved in that church for two years. And then we came back to the Wells when we moved to Washington, D.C. Do you have two children? Two boys. Um, a 29-year-old now and a 26-year-old. And we're going to be leaving next week to go visit them for a couple weeks down on the Gulf Coast. So one, uh, our oldest is in Baton Rouge and our youngest is over in Houston. I just want to point out that Robin just looked at you like she was expecting you to know the, the ages of your sons. And he's, uh, he's a numbers guy. He has always been a numbers guy. And if there's numbers involved, I know he's got it. He's got a handle on it. And he just had a birthday. So oh, yeah. do you know the I, ages of your I, boys? I can tell you what grades they're in. Yeah. And uh, that's that's how I kind of keep track of it. Um. But uh, I, I also wanted to say that since we're going to be looking at the Good Shepherd for our uh, scripture reading today, um, being obviously in a, an officer type position, you've had a lot of experience with leadership. And uh, I suppose this could be for either of you, parenting, uh, or uh, I don't know, we haven't talked about any kind of work that you've done, uh, Robin, but uh, it, it, when it comes to the military, um, what kinds of things can you say about shepherding people. Robin's looking at me again. I, I, uh, so I've been very fortunate in my career. Um, so I've had, we've done 12 moves and in those 12, uh, 12 different assignments, I've had three command positions. So I've been D one in charge. So I had a 110 foot patrol boat with 17 people entrusted to me, a 225 foot buoy tender with 50, uh, men and women assigned to me. And then I was responsible for a sector field office in Memphis, where I had over 150 men and women spread throughout six states and about 1,500, 1,800 uh, miles of the Mississippi, the Arkansas, and the, and the Red Rivers. Um, when you have that many people, there's a lot of things that, that come up. You have a lot of personnel issues, interpersonal problems that, that you have to deal with. Um, and I found that, that my faith and the religious principles that I've learned throughout my life kind of grounded me in how to handle those, um, the empathy that you have to have, um, when you're dealing with people, I mean, you're dealing with people's families, um, they have family issues, death, uh, marriages, childbirth. Um, there's so many different things that, that people deal with in life, um, the other thing that I, I was very blessed to have is I've had really good military chaplains that support the military commands as well. Um, so I've gotten to know them and they come in you know, Baptist, Catholic. Um, so whatever, whatever denomination that chaplain is, that's what they bring um, to their, their service in the military. So the military chaplain corps um, that I, my experience has been phenomenal with as well. And they're there to advise us on how to, how to kind of work through those issues. What I think was really interesting is how you put that, uh, I think a knee-jerk way to say it would be, I'm in charge of 150, or I'm in charge of, but that, uh, did you notice that, how he was he was actually saying, I had this many people assigned to me? In other words, it you, you looked at it as a job I have to do rather than I'm telling these people what to do. Yeah, and I think the word I used was entrusted. Oh, sure. Um, it wasn't... So the Coast Guard assigns you people. And the, the beautiful thing for me with assignments is you every year we go through the process of somebody's leaving. And I still deal with that at work now. I've got people that are leaving this summer going to a new assignment. As a civilian, I'm the continuity now. I've been there for five years. We have a couple. We've got one guy as a civilian who's been there almost 20. We're the continuity. We are there to just kind of keep the office moving and pretty stable. The military keeps rotating in and out. So we lose a third every year and we get a new third in. 
So the, the, there's a constant churn in the workforce. Um, so it's it's kind of neat to see you've got really good people that you've gotten to know over three or four years. They leave, you get three or, you know more people in that you're going to work with for the next three or four years. And to see their progression is kind of neat as well. Um, so to me, that, that's the nice thing I like about the military, the Coast Guard, and, and it's the people that we serve with um, and, and the families that we get to meet in different assignments that make make the time in the military so much fun. So with that, Robin, uh, we've talked about Tim and what he's done. So what if, what do you do to keep yourself busy, especially when, as you said before, of how many days he's gone away from home? Now he's, he's home a lot more now, but before that, what, what kind of things did you do and do you do? Well, it, when he was stationed on ships, obviously when the ship's gone, dad's gone. Um, but when he was in offices, he or any field offices, then he was home a lot more. Um, I have been known to ask him after a, a duty change, a just duty station change and say, isn't he's moved into an office? And I'll say, um, isn't the boat leaving soon? <laughs> because I wasn't used to having him around that often. Um, so I, but I, I ended up, um, I can't say I didn't have a career. I was a stay-at-home mom. Um, I did train as a medical assistant, um, and I did do that, our first assignment. Um, but when we looked at the finances of it, and knowing I, other than the Coast Guard family we had, there really was no backup. So um, for me, um, and to be honest, for what money I would make, I'd be paying at least that out in daycare for somebody else to you know, watch my kids during the day while I go work and then pay. So, um, we lived conservatively, smartly. Um, we were able to flourish even though I was not working. My husband got very used to me not having a job so that when we decided to go home, he could just say, all right, this is what the schedule looks like. And we were able to pick up and go, we don't have to worry about me taking any time off or trying to get enough time off. Mm -hmm. Um, so I enjoy crafting. I raise the boys. You know, we didn't have that network of, hey, mom, can you come over and watch the boys for a few minutes? Or we want to go, you know, we did have babysitters. We did have um, the fellow Coast Guard families. Um, and we all supported each other. Um, we just didn't have the luxury of saying, hey, mom or dad, grandma, grandpa, can you come over and watch the boys? So, um, well, yeah, what you're talking about, that's something I've, discuss with my daughters too, you know, they're all going to college or graduated college and so forth. But it's a conversation I've had with, with each of them to say, uh, you know, it's awesome that you want to get this career in agriculture or flying or, uh, you know, Bell wants to go into studying dead people and so forth. And, and I t and tell them all, Hey, these are all great vocations, but understand that it's okay and it's actually better if you're at home, stay, you know, staying home and taking care of the children. That's a wonderful vocation. Like you said, no one else can raise your kids better than you can. Yes. And now that our kids are grown and flown and out of college and off the payroll, we like to say, um, now I use my time to do things for church, lead ladies Bible study, um, Tim and I are both active in different veterans organizations and their auxiliaries. Um, so we spend our time volunteering. So that right. and opened, it... opened, opened, you know, once, once the, that kids are gone is gone, then, um, that opened up our schedule, my schedule for volunteering. But we kind of jokingly say Robin's retired. Yeah, Robin's, <laughs> Robin's retired. I like it. And so <laughs> with that, the last thing that Robin mentioned, uh, Tim, uh, I think she said that you had gone out to Madison this week. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah. So, um, the veterans group I belong to is AMVETS and Military Officers Association of America, but I'm also a, um, member of, uh, disabled American veterans on the national level and DAV, uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars, VFW and American Legion sponsored a veterans rally at the Capitol on Wednesday, um, to try and, uh, while we, we were advocating for 
two bills that are in uh, the Assembly and in the, in the Senate here in the state of Wisconsin. So we went over, uh, we had a rally in the rotunda. The governor spoke, the uh, WDVA, Wisconsin Department of Veterans Affairs, Secretary-designee Bond spoke, and then we had time to go meet with our legislators. Uh, so I got to go meet with uh, Senator Wangard and Representative Boss on Wednesday to advocate for a couple of bills that are pending. And they better listen because... You know, you're high, you're high ranking Coast Guard. For I'm some... retired also. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, you want to get into the gospel lesson for this Sunday? Yes. The gospel comes from John 10. Jesus says, Amen, amen, I tell you. Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the door, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The doorkeeper opens the door for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own sheep, he walks ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger, but will run away from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration in speaking to the people, but they did not understand what he was telling them. So Jesus said again, Amen, amen, I tell you. I am the door for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So, Tim and Robin, in this parable, who are the sheep the shepherd and the robbers. We're pointing at each other again. <laughs> um, so I would say the sheep are believers, people that uh, follow Jesus. Uh, they, uh, and the, the shepherd would be Jesus and the robbers would be those trying to keep us from him, the devil and, and his followers. Right. So then Jeremy, how are we like sheep? We like to move in herds. Uh, we like to follow whatever everybody else is doing. Uh, and, and even, even if nobody else is doing it, uh, we, we go and seek out somebody else that we can make a flock with. Um, we are, uh, oh, I, I always like, uh, one thing that a student of mine said. We're going to read first Peter, uh, Lord willing, if we get to the second lesson today. And, um, <laughs> And I, I teach First Peter at Shoreland, and one of my students last year, anyway, was a boy who works on a farm, and he had an interesting way of putting it. He said, "Sheep, it is, seems like sheep. It's their life's mission to find new and ingenious ways of killing themselves." <laughs> we are, we tend to be very foolish and uh, often self-destructive, even. Right. Yeah, since my neighbor and I are raising some chickens, uh, we have some laying hens, and then we have some some meat chickens that we lovingly call meat bags. They are not smart. I mean, hens are, are the. It's just interesting. Of you know, I had chickens growing up, and I never really noticed the difference, but because they hung out together. But raising these chicks from that are laying hens, and then the chicks that grow up to be the the meat bags, there's a definite difference. Those meat bags, that's all they do is they eat for 12 hours and then you put them, you put the food away and you put them in the pen. But that's all they do is sit around and eat. And, uh, like I said, I, I, I think that we could be compared to these meat chickens too, not just sheep, because we're, they're not very smart. We're not very smart. And just like sheep have natural predators, so these chickens do too. We found out that the hard way last year that my youngest daughter, Belle, and I did not get the meat chickens into the pen early enough before the sun went down. Didn't think it was a big deal until we went into the pen and there's five dead chickens that a mink had gotten in there. So now they have to be locked up before it gets dark. Uh, also, we lost one of the chicks when my neighbor girl, she dropped something on its head and and. That expired that way. And then we lost one from an owl, just swooping in and getting it. But uh, 
I just use that as an example, too, of other ways that we, I think, are described like sheep or these chickens because we have these predators out there of the roaring lion of the devil and the uh, demonic ravenous, ravenous wolves and then the world that's like a pack of wild dogs coming at us and we have no way to defend ourselves. I think another th reason uh, that just hit me about a comparison with sheep is um, one time I remember reading about, I, I don't know much about shepherding or sheep. It's, everything I know is stuff I've read. and uh, But I do remember reading one time that um, shepherds like to play with their sheep. Like they make up games and the sheep will play along. It'll be It'll be kind of a game back and forth, like, you know, maybe like hide and seek or something like that. And, uh, I think that's something that we have a lot in common with sheep then that we're, we're playful. We like, we like playing games. Well, and I think people that have pets, we don't have pets, but people that have a dog or a cat, they like to play games. They like to play with a the ball. They like to go fetch. I mean, there's a lot of things and it's playful. It's engagement. Kids are the same way. And I think to some extent we are as well. We like to have fun, mm -hmm. whether it's going to listen to a concert or going to a ball game. It's, it's entertainment. Exactly. And, and I think too, you know, growing up on the farm where we had chickens that we had were guinea fowl. Some people have peacocks because they will protect the flock. Even just the guinea fowl, just their annoying sound will keep predators away. And there I think of my sister raises alpacas. And so some uh, shepherds with their sheep, they'll have a dog, but sometimes they'll just have alpacas and, and llamas because, uh, my dog found this out the hard way with the alpaca that it will come up behind. It, it'll stand there and it'll kick and it'll bite and so forth. But a coyote or a wolf that comes, the alpaca will protect the sheep because, again, the sheep have no way of protecting themselves. So, Tim and Robin, how are the devil, his demons, and false preachers like robbers? Oh, I guess, Robin, you have to answer this one. <laughs> You got anything? I was just going to add the what the thing you said at the end uh, that we're, uh, another thing that makes us like sheep is the vulnerability. That's kind of that was kind of your point. Yeah, is uh, we're there we're vulnerable to a lot of predators. Yeah, and I and I think a robber is trying to take something away from you, and that's what the devil um, was the devil is demons and false teachers or preachers are trying to take away the truth from you. They're trying to separate you from God. And that's a robber's trying to separate you from something, whether it's a possession of money or something else. Right. And with what you just said, Tim, uh, I think a lot of times we read John 10 just on its own as a good shepherd chapter. But it's always interesting to know that John 10 follows John 9. That makes sense. But we read those two chapters separately. John 9, uh, Jesus has just healed a man. And now the man is, uh, who's healed is dragged before, uh, the Sanhedrin and they're accusing this man and Jesus, uh, of false teaching and healing on the Sabbath and all those kinds of things. And so now Jesus is talking to these Pharisees and then he directs this parable to them. And I think we kind of forget that, that when he talks about the thieves and robbers, he's talking about them. And I think we talked about that when we watched this episode in The Chosen a few weeks ago. Um, I, I, I think I remember you talking about um, that aspect, because I thought we talked about John 10 in the after discussion that we had about the Sanhedrin and um, how they were the ones that were being called uh, thieves. Right. So then, Jeremy, what's the relationship of a shepherd to a sheep? Uh, a very close one. Um, it's, uh, it, he's got a personal investment in them. I uh, usually think of like David being a member of the family that owned the sheep. Um, the, I, as I was reading, what kind of struck me is that there's this, this particular section of John 10 doesn't actually have Jesus saying, I'm the good shepherd. Uh, it, what he says more often is, I am the door. And that is that is kind of the, the focal point of this particular reading. 
Yeah, and we're going to get to that with the, with the next question. But with this, the first few verses, he does talk about the relationship of a shepherd with the sheep, that he knows their names. So I use this devotion or this text this morning for my chapel devotion with our elementary and middle school children and with the grandparents because it was grandparents day. And so I asked the grandparents if any of them knew their grandchildren's full name and then why it was that name. And I asked them, you know, if they knew what their grandchild's first or favorite subject was that wasn't Fayed or recess or lunch. And, and then I asked them, and do you know your grandchild's favorite, your best friend? And, you know, they knew some of those things, which is pretty awesome. But I was making the point, Jesus knows all of those things. He knows our name. And I was really encouraging the grandparents in this section that uh, they need to have their grandchildren's, uh, have, that they have Jesus' name on their lips. He knows their names through baptism. Uh, they need to know his name. And I said, when they come over to the house, have them put their phone away. I said, they'll be upset with you for like a minute. But if you put your phone away and you're t- talking with them and hanging out with them, they won't mind it at all. They will cherish that and remember it. And I said, and then talk to them. You know, if, if their opportunity comes up, read scripture together. Pray together so that you have Jesus' name on your lips, and then they can have Jesus' name on their lips. Because the imagery that Jesus has here is that in the evening, the shepherds would, you might have, say, a handful of shepherds that would put their sheep together into uh, an enclosure, and then in the morning, they would all separate, and they would call their sheep by name, and then they would come to them. And if a stranger, you know, a different shepherd is calling them, they don't go to them. And that's the point Jesus is making here. Uh, so then that gets to that next question. Uh, Tim and Robin, what does Jesus mean by liking, likening himself to a gate? Any ideas? You want to take it? <laughs> well, when I think of a gate, it's a gate's a way to get in or out of someplace. And Jesus is the way for us to get into heaven. So in that respect, he's the gate. Yeah. And the other thing I would say is gates could be big or they could be small. And the, the narrow road comes to mind here. You've got a narrow road leading to a gate and following Jesus and following God's, God's word, God's law. Um, you've got the law and the gospel kind of working together there to get to heaven. I remember reading something about, um, how in the, Biblical times, the the person would act. The gate would actually be a human. It would be a, a man who would the shepherd. Often the shepherd himself would just. It, it would be an opening in the wall, and then the shepherd would plop himself down there and like kind of curl up inside of that opening. And so, so the the gate is a human, and that's that's what Jesus is. He's human, right? And that's what I was going to bring up too. Is Jesus is the gate as a shepherd sleeping in that doorway so that uh, the sheep can get in. He's the entryway, and that's his point here. But also uh, what I talked about with the grandparents today is he's sheltering them. And, and I told the story that my wife Shelly had told me that she was talking to our custodian and uh, for the school, and she had told him, yeah, I, I've led a very sheltered life, Courtney. I've been, went to a Lutheran grade school and a Lutheran high school and a Lutheran college, and now I married a Lutheran pastor. And Courtney, the custodian, said, and thank God that you've been sheltered. And that's what I was telling the grandparents is, for whatever reason, your child has chosen Wisconsin Lutheran School for your grandchildren. And it's a... Uh, it's something to protect them from the things that are being taught in the public schools and in, just in public in general. And uh, thank God that we have that shelter here where Jesus is that doorway. And, and then I really encourage them too. So I challenge them to have Jesus' name on their lips and their grandchildren's lips. Then I challenge them, you need to keep sheltering them in God's word in this school, but also on the weekends. Bring them into the shelter where the rest of the flock is on Sunday morning in your church, but our churches too, that support this school. 
And I said, you know, call up your parent, call up the parent the night before and say, I'm, are you taking my grandchild to church? And if not, you get up and you take your grandchildren to church and tell them 730, I will be there. Now, if it's older teens, you might say 10 o'clock, but whatever, you go and you take them because you shelter them now so that they as sheep and lambs will be with the good shepherd forever. So, Jeremy, why do so many people get so upset when we say that Jesus is that only doorway to heaven? That makes me think of Isaiah, uh, the the suffering servant in uh, chapter 52, 53, um, where it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. All of us have turned, we each have turned to our own way. That we're, we're always thinking, I need to make things up for myself. I need to... Uh, I don't think we'd ever be so crass, especially if you're raised in a sheltered Lutheran uh, setting. We'd ever be so crass as to say, "I save myself." But but we do. I know for me, the tendency is like when I'm thinking of um, making lesson plans for teaching something at school that uh, I don't want to. I don't want to necessarily use what somebody else has already concocted. I want to. I want to be creative. I want to. Uh, cook up my own way of handling the lesson. And uh, that I'm sure that's true in a lot of different types of careers that, that people think, well, I want to branch out on my own. I want to, um, you know, be my own inventive person. And uh, that really gets back to the heart of what our problem is here, that then we're upset to find out, no, there's only one way of receiving eternal life, and that's through Jesus, uh, because we always want to create our own gods right yeah people want heaven but without uh jesus being the gate to get them into heaven they, they want salvation without the savior uh, i think they want to live their lives with the robbers without ever having follow the shepherd and i think people in our culture especially now as i think we are becoming in america more and more unchristian uh that this this is very true, this gospel lesson. And I told a story to my catechism students this week. Uh, I said, do you know what a thruple is? And thankfully they didn't. Do you know what a thruple is? Yeah, well, I, I said, a thruple is, uh, this one is three gay guys. And one of my students almost fell out of his seat when I told them that. And they said, yeah, I just read the story that this thruple of three gay dudes they, they're the second couple thruple in America that have adopted a child. At the same time, I told them the story of a Christian widow. Her husband had died six years ago in a car accident and they were going through the process of adopting a child. Now she wants to go back and do that, but she will not uh, sign off on all of the wokeness of being, uh, if this child raised in your home wants to quote, transition to another gender, then uh, you're unfit. And she's, as a Christian, is unwilling to do that. So you, you see our culture is actually promoting and complimenting and handing over children to crass sin and then for Christians saying, uh, punishing them because they're not willing to go along with the sin of the world. Tim and Robin, what does Jesus mean when he says that they will have life to the full? We actually were looking through the cheat questions this afternoon, and um, I was looking at it, and I said, but I don't see to the full in any of the scripture. Well, that's from a different translation. Right, and then, yeah. then Tim pointed out the have it abundantly. Yeah. Um, my take on that was... Um, that Jesus will, in heaven, we will have everything. And Tim put more of an earthly spin on it. Well, I think I put I put a spin that it was both an earthly and a heavenly heavenly thing. I, with Jesus, we have peace here on the earth, which allows us to have a more enjoyable life here. Although I think we're going to get to it uh, with the suffering part in the in the gospel lesson, <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, as a Christian, when you have a have a death in the family and you're you're grieving, but you you have hope. You 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 you're, you know where your loved one is. 
And there's a lot of comfort there. And that allows you to have a more full life here on this earth. Um, but it, it absolutely allows us to have eternal life in heaven. So I, I mean, the abundantly is the eternal, uh, eternal peace. And I think you can meld both of your thoughts together in the fact that uh, heaven is not the um, last and final and eternal resting stop. It's a resting stop, uh, but, but the new heavens and the new earth that uh, God is going to create after the last day are going to be abundance visible for, for even earthly eyes to see. And that, that is, um, yeah, that's, that's going to bring together both of your thoughts of eternal life and visible life uh, in, in the world to come. Sure. And, and I think of the people here of, to whom I've ministered for 19 years now is because they have peace, joy, and contentment in the abundance to come of the green pastures and quiet waters of paradise from Psalm 23. Now they have that peace, joy, and contentment in the green pastures and quiet waters of the word and sacraments here on earth. Anything that you want to bring up at all with this? No? Jeremy, let's get into the epistle lesson. All right. First Peter chapter 2. For this is favorable. Uh, by the way, what is the this? You have the Bible in front of you. No, yeah. I... I don't have the Bible in front of me. You, you, get you, to fire, you my fire, Bible. fire all these questions at well, us I'll, at, the, at the Wentz and I'll, Robin. And I'll look it up while you keep reading. Oh, my goodness. What is the, the, I can tell you what it is. Do you well, that's why me? I asked you. Oh, back. oh, I've got the answers, <laughs> and I'm going to now tell you the answers. Uh, it is that you, uh, that you bear, on, that, you, that you are suffering, and uh, for, for, you take a beating for, doing a good job at your work. Uh, if you get uh, lambasted or um, harassed by uh, a boss, then uh, that is, that is even when you're doing a good job, that is what is commendable. So this is favorable. Uh, now, I'll, now I'll read the scripture. Uh, 1 Peter 2. For this is favorable. If a person endures sorrows while suffering unjustly because he is conscious of God, for what credit is it to you if you receive a beating for sinning and patiently endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is favorable with God. Uh, indeed, you were called to do this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you would follow in his steps. He did not commit a sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself carried our sins in his body on the tree so that we would be dead to sins and alive to righteousness. By his wounds you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but you are now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So then, Jeremy, why is it commendable before God to endure suffering for doing good? Because God says so. All right. <laughs> but why? Uh, you need a better reason than that? Yeah. Cause there's gotta be a reason. What, what's your reason? Uh, well, it's like, it goes back to that first verse that I didn't remember. Verse 18 of a slave who is being mistreated by his master to remember that he's really free in Christ and his real master, God is loving and faithful. Uh, and though he may not have freedom here on earth, because he's a slave to a master, he has true freedom in heaven through Christ. Uh, and so even if he has to endure suffering here from a master, or like you said, from an employer, uh, we give glory to God because we'll see that that suffering is really pointing to the kind of suffering that Jesus endured. So, Tim and Robin, how could remaining steadfast in the face of unjust ridicule or bearing up under persecution be in any way noble or even honorable? You know what a better question would be? Oh, so and, now I had an answer. Oh, go ahead. I go ahead. this in ladies' Bible study on Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> um, we actually, one of um, the verses that we looked at for the one, the 
the weekly questions that we had was actually First Peter 2, um, I believe it is 4 through 4 and 5. Yes. So it's, we're, we're talking about living, living stones and um, how the, the Bible study that we're working on um, actually shows us the many different ways that God works through us, whether we're wearing the mask of God, whether we're letting the Holy Spirit work through us. Um, and we, we had good discussion on this, how sometimes there are things that we're doing that is um, setting an example for other people, um, showing how we are tolerating what is happening to us or um, that sort of thing just to, um, to, I guess I'm having a hard time putting words to it, just to be letting your, the, the, being in God's word help you to um, basically just muscle through some of the ridicule and um, just things people might throw at you. If, I mean, you might be able to expand on what you're saying if I ask my question that I was thinking, which is, have either of you ever, I guess any of us, can you think of an example of a time when you, you don't have to give a lot of details if it's something confidential, but if you remember suffering unjustly and you didn't lash out, you didn't fight back, you didn't put up a stink, and uh, maybe you even have a, a follow-up story of how that that ended up being a good thing. Uh, well, I can think of one while you two are thinking of one, because you two live in the real world, you know, as opposed <laughs> to Jeremy and myself. Uh, but but there I think of, this is a long time ago, well over 15 years ago, that uh, one of our young members was working at, I think probably Target, and uh, she was trying to talk to one of the friends there at work, and this, this young man was gay, and he engaged in an email conversation with me, and he was fine with that, and, and so I was trying to help him uh, with his homosexual tendencies, and we got to the point where I said, you know, from what I've studied, there are a number of times where men look to becoming gay because they're looking for something because they did not have a good role model in their father. Maybe their father was negligent or abusive and so forth. Uh, and he lashed out. I mean, it was vulgar, the email that I received back from him. And I just emailed him back very calmly and said, you know, I'm just trying to help you out. I don't know you. I never met this guy. I'm just trying to help you out and share God's word with you. And a little while later, he emailed back apologizing. And he said, no, everything you said about my father was exactly right. I didn't know any of that. But it was that kind of thing. That, that wasn't a great persecution, but it was being hammered pretty hard. And you can, you can imagine in our culture now where that's not going, you know, that kind of conversation between the two of us and an email, a lot of times those kinds of things are out in social media, on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And then everyone is hammering you know, that Christian who's trying to give good Christian advice. And then it's hard. And then we, we want to, just be quiet and not sub subject ourselves to that public flogging. Any? I would say I haven't, I wasn't really persecuted. Um, but when we were living in Oregon, um, they had a, I don't even, it, it's been so long. I don't even remember what the name of it was, but it was a, um, the, it was a pro-life. It was Christian-based. It was pro-life. Um, they had counselors there. They had a baby um, a closet that expectant moms who decided to keep their babies were can go shopping in the little pantry and um, that sort of thing. So basically, it was you know counseling for pregnant women that were in a bad situation or not knowing what they wanted to do. And, um, I then, so I volunteered with them basically just stocking things in the back room and that, cause I wasn't trained to be out front, which was 
just fine by me. Um, but when I went to one of our officers' wives' club meetings, they were talking about how there was one gal that one of the gals she was volunteering at one of the local high schools because she was part of the teenage crisis pregnancy office and that and um, I had mentioned that I was volunteering at this pro-life. I didn't say that. I don't remember what the name of it is, but I said that I was volunteering there. I said, so if there are any of these girls that don't choose abortion and want to choose life and would need some help, we are there for them. And the room got really quiet. And then the next day, the president of the officer's wives club called me and said that um, they will not be backing you know, the the organization that I was volunteering at and that that had no place in our meeting. Wow. I said, okay, so you're willing to help the girls in crisis, quote unquote crisis, get rid of their baby. But if they choose to have the baby and possibly put it up for adoption or whatever that family decides, you know, as a whole, um, you're not willing to support that. Yeah. You're not willing to p- support life, but you're willing to support them have an abortion. Just and um, she just said, "Well, that's that just has no place in our meeting." I said, "Okay." Yeah. I had no desire. Not that I had a big desire to be part of this officer's wife club, anyways. <laughs> but because Tim was the commanding officer of the ship that was in town, I played the nice game, and uh, there wasn't a whole lot of things I did. After that, I just thought, you know what? I'm not interested anymore. So I was not ridiculed. I was not attacked. But um, no, that, that's, I, that's, just, I, I was done. That's very, unpleasant. That's, yeah. that's very unpleasant. Yeah. And that was 20 years ago. Yes, it was. It, I, it just but dawned it was on, Oregon. <laughs> it just dawned on me after I asked the question now that I think it's kind of a hard question to answer because a lot of times you're not going to be able to see or know about how your your noble handling of suffering impacted somebody because it they're very few they pe- people aren't going to come out and tell you oh very rarely will they come out and tell you oh i i really like how you stood up and said that or um you you inspired me when you uh just kind of took that that tongue lashing i guess i was thinking of just a this is this is kind of dumb. It's not really a, it's not a persecution for your faith per se. But I remember hearing a radio show where um, it was after, you know, Chick Fil A kind of boomed as a business, and there was a worker that was it was some you know poor teenage girl at the running the drive through, and uh, somebody was pulling up and and instead of giving an order for chicken, uh, they started into this long tirade of tearing, tearing this uh, worker apart for how can you work for a company that is so, um, you know, closed minded and, and backwards in their uh, values. And the people on the radio show that were hosting it were kind of offering commentary about, Hey, just leave the poor girl alone. Like she's just, she's just working a job. And, uh, but, but she was being very polite and um, trying to be as helpful as she could even though the person obviously wasn't interested in giving an order. Um, so I, I don't know if that's a good example. Well, and I was just talking to a teacher recently up in Milwaukee, and he was talking about how he, along with other members of his church, when Milwaukee has their uh, gay pride parade, he goes with his fellow teachers and members to the gay pride parade to hand out gospel tracts and talk to them. I said, oh my goodness, that is, that's amazing. I, I don't know if I have the guts to do that. And he said, it's amazing that he said, yeah, sometimes they'll be yelling at us and so forth and vulgar, but that's why they stay in large groups or there's at least a number of them together. But he said, when we have people off the side, the people are actually very pleasant and they'll ask questions and we, we leave them with the gospel track and we let the, let God, uh, the Holy Spirit work on them. But they're not going there so that they can endure suffering. They're not looking for it. But they are engaging the culture. 
which is, I think, a lot of times we're afraid to do. Well, I, I think to to your point, we're afraid of being canceled mm -hmm. because we're human, and it's hard to engage with people on issues that they're passionate about when they're wrong. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of times it's they're passionate and it's about their emotions. And it's not about the facts. And we're just trying to give them the facts of what Scripture says. So, Jeremy, I think this is an interesting question where what does Peter mean when he explains you were called to do this? He probably had in mind uh, his teacher, Jesus, who said, uh, if anyone wants to come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. So, um you need to go into the Christian faith with your eyes open uh, and, and realize that uh, it's going to involve suffering. There, I don't know if our listeners have watched Babylon B and you know, read the articles or seen the videos. Have you seen them and so forth? So there's a really great one. I, I encourage our listeners to, to check out, uh, go find it on YouTube, but it's uh, they've got the apostles and it's like, uh, Friday or Saturday evening of Holy Week and Judas is, has killed himself and Peter is there leading the group around a fire saying, all right, Jesus died. Now we need to go and die with him. We need to go and spread this gospel and we need to suffer. And then he talks about the way that they're all going to die. Like One of us is going to be run through with a spear by a heathen priest. One of us is going to be crucified upside down. One of us is going to be flayed, you know, skinned alive and so forth. And then they have John saying, wait, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? We're not getting this for money and glory and fame. He said, no, we're doing this so we can be put to death. It's just that, that sarcastic humor to show you know, what the apostles were doing this for and why it's not for fame and glory and money. It was because Christ died and rose again. And so they're excited to go do that. They're actually jumping up and down. They're fist bumping. They're jumping up and doing the fan, the, the man chest bump but, and stuff. And, and that was even, I saw that video and that was even a clip to prove um, that what, that, that was what you would call apologetics. It was, it was in a satirical way, but what they were saying is that, the resurrection of Jesus is a hoax. And that uh, if you think about it logically, why would these people, uh, why would these men and women and all the believers go through all this suffering for a hoax? If they were just trying to um, uh, trick people into believing that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, uh, no, this is actually a, a piece of evidence. This is proof that the bodily resurrection of Christ is a physical reality. So Tim and Robin, in a sense, Jesus suffered unjustly because of us. What does that mean? You mean take it? <clears throat> Jesus, Jesus didn't do anything wrong. He, he paid the price for us. Every wrong that we've ever done or will do, he paid the price. So it was not just um, that he had to pay that price. We did not pay that price. So, so the last one I have, Jeremy, is right at the end, Peter writes, uh, For you are like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So I guess just wrapping it up, tying it all together with the gospel lesson, how, again, are we like sheep that go astray and that Jesus is the shepherd? And then he adds the other word, overseer, for our souls. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think you could hearken back to the fact that Jesus also is called the Lamb of God uh, and that, uh, that he's one of us. He is one of the sheep, and yet he's also a shepherd. Um and uh, so in a way you can say he, in the same way you can say he is um, our savior. And that's the most important thing is that he redeemed us. And that is the only way that we have eternal life. Uh, and at the same time, you can use his suffering as a template. It's an example that you can follow uh, when you look at your own life. It, it brings sense. It brings, um, uh it makes sense out of our, our suffering that we have to go through. Yeah, and what you said about Jesus is both the lamb and the shepherd. So 
for our listeners, if they see a, a painting, a stained glass window of a lamb that's wounded, you know, J- Peter says it's by his wounds that we are healed. And so a lot of times you'll see a, a lamb maybe on the altar, on the throne with a, his, uh, throat is slit or he's pierced in the side like Jesus on the cross had his side pierced and it's by his wounds we are healed and then the shepherd at our water of life for seeing campus we have a beautiful stained glass window of Jesus as the good shepherd and he's holding two lambs in his hands and there's about a dozen adult sheep around his feet and I love pointing to that picture I probably preached for all the funerals I've done in the 19 years, I probably preached at least a third of them on some text from John 10 or Psalm 23 because our, our members, they see that stained glass window, uh, Sunday after Sunday. And so it has deep meaning for them. And what I always remind people is that we are sheep who go astray. We're looking for greener grass and other waters. And that's where the danger is. But when we're in his hands as lambs and we're by his sheep or by his feet as sheep, you know, they're the, the predators can't get at us because they're Jesus going to reach out with his rod and, you know, back them away. Uh, and he is the overseer of our souls. He's watching us all the time uh, and caring for our souls. Anything else that anyone wants to bring up on these texts? No. All right, so we'll wrap it up here. This is Michael Zarling with Tim and Robin Went. And since we talked about Jesus as the door, uh, we also have Lighten in My Fire, which is by the doors. So let the, let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wants the water of life take it as a gift. Stay thirsty, my friends, and drink deeply from the water of life. <laughs>